Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Galesburg, Illinois. I got to think of a way to say Galesburg, like I say, Mac home. Uh, I'll, I'll work on that, listeners. But uh, here, and we're going to be chatting with Nick Frillman uh, in just a second, all about growing shiitake mushrooms. So we're really excited for that. This is our first non-plant topic, because remember, folks, mushrooms are fungus. That's a whole different kingdom, more closely related to humans than plants. So I'm excited to, to dive into this topic. And you know, I'm not doing this by myself. I am joined, as always, every single week by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Saw you visit the, the barber too recently. I did. I, I ran into a buzzer and it got me real good. <laughs> got my hair, got my beard, got everything. So I don't even recognize this person I'm looking at with this camera. Uh, so how are you doing, Ken? I, I see you. You got a trim, though, up top. Yeah, a little bit off the off the bridge, a little shorter now. OK, yeah. Mm -hmm. Much cooler. We'll keep yeah. getting shorter as the year goes on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, well, once we get out of these frosty nights that we keep getting here in April, even though right now it's April 25th and I keep getting these frost warnings on my phone. This is getting annoying but at this point in time, folks. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah. So apologize, Ken. I got, uh, I, as we were getting ready for this show, uh, the, uh, both Ken and Nick just watched me stuff my face. <laughs> so I just ate really quick. <laughs> I apologize uh, if I have to go and take an antacid here in just a second, but I'll be fine. Um, because um, I'm excited to talk about, about this because we're talking about something that I don't really eat that much. I remember as a kid, I grew up on canned mushrooms, which are just the worst. I can't stand them. They're so rubbery and ugh. And then as an adult, I got introduced to like this thing known as like fresh mushrooms that aren't um, button or portobello. It's like it's like beyond the what I have been taught induced as a kid. So I'm kind of on the mushroom train. But I still pick them off the pizza if they're on the pizza. So I don't know, Ken. What do you are you a, a mushroom uh, a eater? Uh, yes, yeah, we eat mushrooms. Well, my wife and I do. The kids, not so much. We chop them up and hide them in food, and then tell them after the fact, mm -hmm. and they get all yep. angry at us. But like, hey, you guys ate them. You didn't complain. Exactly. I mean, it, it prepared most ways. They're they're flavorless. You know, there's not much to them, but prepared in certain ways that can really enhance a dish. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about this. It's always something I've wanted to investigate more growing mushrooms. And so I, I'd say without further ado, uh, we welcome Nick Frillman, local food, small farms educator out of the Bloomington Normal Office. Nick, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris and Ken, uh, happy to be here and talking about one of my favorite topics. Shiitake mushrooms. I, I'm excited to learn about this. So Nick, both Ken and I shared our, our backstory with, with mushrooms as kids. Were you a mushroom eater as a child? Um, I have never been, uh, nor am I currently a picky eater. Um, mm -hmm. My dad mm -hmm. would like feed me jalapenos and mushrooms and, you know, Kalamata olives and all sorts of weird stuff um, from really eclectic grandparents um, just all the time as a baby. And he just has described to me a couple of times just watching um parents watching me eat like just about anything they'd put in front of me so yeah I was always a mushroom eater uh, as a child but you know back in the day um I don't think we ate canned mushrooms too much but we definitely had mushrooms on pizza um big family favorite in pe on pizza night is uh the supreme or the you know what do you call it everything pizzas uh, mm -hmm. vegetarian so they throw you know mushrooms onions green peppers olives etc so yeah um been familiar with eating and eating them for a long time um, just like uh, you both, my background is um, horticulture, agroforestry, specialty crops. And so I didn't really get into the mushroom cultivation side of things until, um, yeah, until my first days with uh, Illinois Extension. And um, yeah, I think it's a good idea to fill in our listeners on, yeah, what shiitake mushrooms are, just in case um, they're unfamiliar with anything except button mushrooms. And um, they are a wood living fungus uh, that's native to East Asia. Um, including but not limited to Japan, China, and Korea, where they're most thoroughly cultivated and have been intentionally cultivated on logs uh, for centuries. So a um, little bit of a backstory there, but that's just kind of an, an intro into yeah, what we've been talking about, what we will talk about. Um, they're what's considered considered a gourmet mushroom. So your portobellas, baby bellas, cremini, 
um, portobellos, et cetera. Um, those are um, relatively cheap at the grocery store, uh, pretty common. Things like lion's mane, shiitake, uh, oyster mushroom, and, and others are what we refer to now as gourmet or specialty mushrooms because they command a higher price point. They're a little more difficult to grow. And uh, they're typically available at local co-ops, uh, local grocery stores that specialize in yeah, organic um, locally sourced produce, farmers markets, and you can find them dehydrated um, at most Asian grocery stores. So they're around if you look for them. I didn't, I didn't realize that the baby bellas and the buttons that I was, as I moved out uh, as a young adult into the world and I got a cutting board, a knife, and I had some mushrooms and I didn't realize I was just eating kind of the filler stuff, not, not the good stuff. And that's probably why I got off on the wrong foot with mushrooms too. Um, I, I had to, I had to cook them in a way that they had to be unhealthy because so they could taste good. So bacon <laughs> grease, butter, both bacon grease and butter yes. together, um, copious amounts of salt. So, okay, good to know that we're talking about a gourmet mushrooms here. Okay, mm. very good. Um, so when it comes to gourmet mushrooms, Nick, mm. is this something anyone can do? Can I make my own gourmet mushrooms? Can I, or do I have to go uh, out and and forage uh, at a local specialty food store? <laughs> Foraging at the grocery store, I like it. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, yeah, right. This is a a, um, a specialty gourmet mushroom. Um, by the way, the flavor profile of these things is even a little more unique from other gourmet mushrooms. Flavor profile of shiitake being um, a, having a satisfying texture, having a rich flavor that's been described as meaty, smoky, earthy, kind of umami-like, takes on the flavor of a lot of other um, savory flavors. So it's great. And to answer your question, yes, you can. And that's kind of where we'll, we'll go with the rest of the show. Um, yes, you can grow your own shiitake mushrooms um, with a little bit of investment, um, both monetary and time-wise. Um, just about anybody can grow shiitake mushrooms um, as long as the uh, growing conditions are met, just like a tomato or pepper or a strawberry plant or what have you. There's a lot of similarities between growing mushrooms and growing plants. So if we decide we want to grow mushrooms, what are some of those, some of that equipment uh, that we would need to do that? Yeah, um, great question. And uh, I think this is when I'll begin the show and tell aspect of the show. <laughs> um, so there's a, a low tech, low budget, um, and a higher tech, higher budget way um, to begin this um, inoculation process. And we'll kind of, we'll get into um, exactly uh, the wood that we use to, to grow on, but first we'll cover the equipment. Um, so the low tech and low budget is what I'll show first. And so um, broadly speaking, we're gonna get um, a log cut from a fresh healthy tree, and we're gonna drill a hole into that log with one of two devices we're gonna plug that hole with one of two options in terms of um, mushroom uh, or fungal material. And then we're gonna wax that hole over uh, with uh, food grade paraffin wax. And then we'll get into the aftercare of your log, um, how the, the mushroom mycelium that we've put into that log with tools um, eats through the log and how it eventually gives us mushrooms. But um, first thing you could do, low tech, low budget option. And for listeners just watching, um, this is called a uh, 5 16 inch um, drill bit, and it's got a stop collar on it is what it's called, 5 16 inch stop collar. Um, this is a wood bit, obviously, because we're drilling into wood. Um, I learned the hard way last week when I put on a shiitake uh, uh, log workshop that this will not work if your drill battery is 2 amp. Um, hmm. My drill battery was 2 amp, and it was not powerful enough to drill the holes that I needed in the log. Luckily, my friend was there who had a four amp drill or four amp battery for the drill, and that worked fine. So um, as long as you have a drill that's actually meant to like do work instead of just put nails <laughs> in the wall, um, this this will work. And so you can get this drill bit with stop collar um, through a couple of different um, mushroom cultivation supply shops online. Uh, we'll get to that part in a little bit. But so if you're looking for low tech, low budget way to do this, you need a specialized drill bit, a little piece of metal called a stop collar, um, a drill, a power drill, which most people already have corded or cordless at their homes for, um, you know, around the house projects. More and than you, two amp, yes. Yeah, yeah, um, more, hopefully more than a two amp battery. Um, and then, so, okay, we've drilled a hole into a log. Now, what do we do? 
Um, we've got these things. This is one of two different types of mushroom. Um, uh, it's called spawn. Um, so there's plug spawn, sawdust spawn, or grain spawn. Maybe you'll get into that. But these are little wooden plug spawns that I'm holding up to the camera. And it's uh, they've been drilled, pre-drilled. Um, oak sterilized uh, wood plugs have been pre-drilled to fit that drill bit hole size, 5 16 inch. So you drill your hole. The stop collar will stop it at the exact height of the of the wood plug. And then you got your handy dandy hammer. A rubber mallet would also work fine. And then you insert your 5 16 inch plug spawn um, into that hole. And it'll be kind of tight, but it goes in completely flush with the hole that you've drilled, as long as you hit it pretty hard with a hammer or a rubber mallet. And then last but not least, and this is the same case with uh, the next way to uh, inoculate that we'll talk about, this is a wax dauber. It's basically a piece of metal with a cotton ball or a piece of fuzz on the end. Because mm -hmm. what we're gonna need to do is purchase paraffin wax or plug spawn wax. Um, and then you basically just apply a little bit of wax to that hole and we wanna seal that. The reason that we want to seal it is so we can prevent competitor fungi from getting into the log, getting down into that hole that we've created, and um, infecting the rest of the log with non shiitake fungus. That that plug spawn, I'm for listeners, it's about the size of a cigarette filter, but you know it's yeah. not not that big. Um, everything you've shown us, Nick, I have all of this at home, minus the spawn. I don't have the spawn at home. And he's showing a close up there of that. It looks like a bag of used cigarettes. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a, that's the way a I can of, describe it. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a bag of used cigarette butts, but up close, they're they're made out of wood. They're not cigarette butts, mm -hmm. and uh, there's like white film on them. If if uh, folks look at the video or just imagine in their mind's eye, this white film kind of covering and connecting all these plugs. That's actually the shiitake fungus mycelium. So we'll go to that for one second. Think of um, think of the mycelium or of the uh, of the fungus as like the green growing tissue of a tomato plant. Um, so basically, the mycelium is that green growing plant. We're not going to harvest that. We're not going to eat that. But eventually, it will um, consolidate itself into the fruiting body, otherwise known as what most people know as the mushroom part of the fungus. So eventually, that little plug spawn will um, be shot into this log, covered with wax, and over the next six to 12 months, the mycelium will move from that little plug into the sapwood and the heartwood of the log, and slowly but surely consume all of its food resource, which is this rich, awesome, um, you know, watery, woody material that is a, a log that's been well inoculated and well sealed. And then once the mycelium consumes all of the food resource that is that woody log material, it will then shoot mushrooms out of those, um, grow mushrooms out of those inoculation sites and push those things open. And that's where um, your initial mushrooms will come out of the log. So that was a little bit more detail than I wanted to go, go into, but um, kind of necessary to understand the process. So I've, I've explained the low tech, low budget way to go. The high tech, higher tech, I should say, higher budget way to go is the same companies where you can get plug spawn um, and other supplies, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, they also sell higher tech solutions. So if you're going to inoculate like 30 to 50 logs, like I did for a class, that's a lot of drilling to do um, with just a regular power drill. And so um, this one, one of three companies I'll mention called Field and Forest Products out of Peshtigo, Wisconsin, um, they sell, and I think two other companies sell this thing, which is an adapted angle grinder. So it does need power. It's it's corded, so you need to buy be buy a power strip when you're doing this. But it's got a modified drill bit on it instead of a wheel sander function um, that will basically grab that wood and poke a huge hole, a little bit bigger than that five sixteenths hole into the wood. Um, and then at that point, we've got sawdust spawn for these holes. So I'm gonna hold this up to the camera. This is just a piece of like what was once a five pound sawdust block. Mm. So the sawdust is sterilized un, uh, under 15 PSI of pressure and over 200 degrees of heat for two hours in a lab using a HEPA filter and fancy equipment that we don't have to worry about if we buy this online from one of a couple of different companies. And then they themselves inoculate that sterilized sawdust with the shiitake fungus. The only difference is instead of a wood plug, 
this is sawdust that's had um, shiitake fungus added to it, spores added to it. And then over time, it'll take over that sawdust. We get it shipped in the mail and we poke into it with an inoculator tool. So this thing runs you about nine bucks, um, maybe 10. And it's got a thumb push port and it's got a hole in the end, roughly shaped like that cigarette butt description Chris just said. Mm -hmm. So you basically dump your sawdust spawn into a little bowl or a bucket, or last week I even used an empty coffee mug that was pretty wide. And then, you know, you basically stab, stab, stab into your like mug full of coffee, uh, not coffee, mug full of uh, sawdust spawn, and it'll hold about an inch worth of um, sawdust. And then you go over the hole that you just made with your um, inoculator tool, you hit the plunger, and then you should get that sawdust pretty flush with, um, with the log. Uh, and so after that, you dab it with wax, same exact process. The only difference is it's a different tool and it's a different, uh, different spawn type. So Nick, with the high speed drills or the angle grinder you're using, I've hurt myself many times using power tools on stuff. Um, <laughs> do you find that when you're drilling holes, is the log want to spin? Do you have to brace it with something? Mm, mm, great question. Um, yeah, so my process um, at the Refuge Food Forest um, here in Normal, Illinois, where I did a workshop in front of 30 people last week was um, I got two sawhorses. And um, yeah, we'll get into the, the sourcing of the log portion in a minute. But what you need to know for this question is those logs can get heavy. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking about a 40 pound log, 30 to 30 to 40 pound log, um, lift that very carefully wearing, you know, steel toed boots or at the very least closed toed shoes and you lift it and put it on, um, two sawhorses Our luckily our sawhorses have, um, like a bumpy plastic texture. If it was just a straight up wood sawhorse, it might jangle around a little bit, but ours does not. They kind of have like gripping plastic teeth on the top levels of the sawhorse. And so the answer to your question was no, not at all. Um, it just, the log totally stays there. Um, we'll, we'll provide some resources for folks to check out um, in the podcast show notes um, where folks can watch a video of uh, a demo of that tool. It is pretty intimidating, like just to watch how it works, but there's, there's, um, there's actually a safety on the trigger similar to a firearm. So you can't actually engage it unless one finger is grabbing the safety and the other finger is grabbing the um, kind of red trigger, which is even, it's really great that it's color coded. So you're like, okay, it's action time. So I can be far mm -hmm. enough away from it, but having a good grip on it that it'll work. Um, and yeah, it's it's actually pretty dummy proof. Um, you just gotta, you know, make sure that you know how to use the tool before you actually start inoculating wood. Okay. So I, I mean, I have everything that you've described minus the modified angle grinder. Um, yeah. Uh, but now our, our, I haven't had the paraffin wax. We did the, like a little Cub Scouts thing before and we showed the kids how to make a uh, fire starter using paraffin wax. Oh. So I have a whole bag, like a five pound bag of this stuff. That's perfect. I have everything, but I need a log. Um, so when it comes to growing shiitake mushrooms, I think mm -hmm. we're specifically talking about shiitake at this point. Um, how do we source our logs? What species are we going to be using here? Yeah, this is a great question. And um, and last week, um, I had my friend uh, Jeff Hake um, co-teaching this portion of the class with me. Um, Jeff, um, just like lots of other uh, Illinoisans, is um, co-owner of a woodlot. So um, the best bet for sourcing logs is um, find an owner or a co-owner of a woodlot or an arborist or a um, tree care professional that conducts what's called TSI, timber stand improvement. Um, there's a couple other different terms for that, but on the IDNR page, Illinois Department of Natural Resource page, um, timber stand improvement is basically thinning out of a forested area that's being managed um, for um, eventual timber quality or um, conservation managed for um, species retention. So in our area of Illinois, at least here in Bloomington Normal, and I think in Macomb as well, probably in Jacksonville as well. Our native um, used to be still kind of native biome is an oak hickory savanna, at least in, in this area of Illinois. So um, that means that, you know, there were open landscapes um, pocketed by, you know, small areas of lots of oaks, lots of hickories. Um, but the best uh, wood to use for shiitake cultivation 
is a tie between sugar maple and white oak. And so if I'm trying to steward my oaks and my hickories, and those are extremely valuable trees for biodiversity and for um, other species that depend on those tree species, um, by far and away the best trees, at least in our area to source for this project is maple. Um, and that's because it's super prolific. It's relatively low, va low value ecologically divert, like ecological diversity wise compared to oaks and hickories in our area. Um, you probably won't convince many people to cut down a really nice oak tree, but <laughs> maples grow like crazy. They grow in the shade. They'll shade each other out. They'll shade other species out. And um, I think Chris Evans, uh, our Illinois Extension Forester, has talked about the phenomenon of maple creep before. So it's coming into areas where it didn't used to grow, thanks to climate change, as I believe how I understood that. And so we're actually doing our forests a favor by sourcing specifically um, sugar maple um, as as uh, our mushroom log species. So you mentioned you know, the, the plug spawn, sawdust spawn, other than kind of the tool you're using to inoculate those logs, is there a benefit to using one over the other? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, to my knowledge, they function just about the same. The time to fruiting, as far as I know, in my experience, is about the same. Um, but I would say the benefit for me um, being well versed with the different tool options and, and spawn options is I can actually inoculate probably, I can probably in, drill and inoculate one um, three foot long, um, six to eight inch diameter um, shiitake bolt. By the way, once they're shiitake logs, the technical term is a bolt. I don't know why, but that's what they're <laughs> called. So um, I can actually inoculate a, a full drill and inoculate a full shiitake bolt in about a minute and a half. And it takes me probably double that amount of time to do it with um, a power drill and the plug spawn. So the advantage of the power drill and plug spawn option is it's low um, cost to entry in terms of buying the materials. It's the same cost between plug spawn and sawdust. Actually, I think plug might be a little bit higher, not that much, like a couple bucks higher for a bag of plugs versus sawdust. You can definitely inoculate way more logs with one bag of sawdust than you can one bag of, of plugs um, because the holes in either situation are supposed to be in a diamond pattern on the log about four inches away from each other anyway. So we're talking about a lot of, a lot of holes per log. And if your bag of plugs is only 500 plugs, you know, you might get 10 logs out of that versus this five pound bag of sawdust spawn that I bought, we inoculated 30 logs. And I think I had enough left for maybe five to 10 more. Mm -hmm. um, so the sawdust one goes quicker, but it, it requires a higher investment of capital to get started. Um, the other one goes slower, requires less capital. So it's, it's, you know, am I just getting into this? Do I just want to try a couple and see how I like it, see if it works? Because, um, yeah, it's a fair step up. I think this, don't quote me on this, I think this tool that I got, the uh, adapted angle grinder with the bit, I think it was something like $120. And the drill bit was, you know, like nine or eight. Um, and in both cases, you need spawn, which is about 25 bucks. You need the inoculator tool, which is another nine. So there is a fair step up. So this tool is only really appropriate if you're going to go for like, 30, 40, 50 logs in a class like I did. The benefit of getting this tool now is that I have everything I need to do this again and again and again as the years go on. The only thing that I might need to replace are the daubers, which are a couple bucks. Um, I might need a couple more inoculator tools as they age, and then I need plugs or sawdust. That's it. So once you've made the investment, it's pretty cheap to keep going. For that angle grinder, do you have to get the one that's like pre-made or, or do they sell like adapters if you already have an angle grinder? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you do not have to get this company's angle grinder. You can just get the adapter, correct? So that would be just the drill bit, which is separate on the end here. This drill bit I think is 12 bucks. And I think the adapter is somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to 20. So yeah, if you already have your nice angle grinder that you know and love, you can adapt it for pretty cheap, mm -hmm. a quarter of the price of the whole thing. Good question. You gave this class to a group of 30 odd people mm -hmm. and they 
you gave him uh, an inoculated log, which is a bolt. So yep. when you said that, it's like, that's probably a, this, the same reason we don't know why. Um, when you train a hops vine up onto a trellis, it's no longer a vine, it's a bine with a yeah. B. So, yeah, I don't so. know why it's called a bine either. That's a great comparison. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so there's that. And so you, you give these people this, this inoculated bolt. So where do they take it? Where, where did you recommend that they take this now to go home to, to now grow mushrooms? Where do we, where do we grow mushrooms at now that we have our bolt? That's an excellent question. And yeah. Um, so first clarification, I did not give them, I did not give them an okay. inoculated log. I made Never them, mind. I made them make their own. <laughs> The only oh, thing good I for did, you. That's important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would not be able to give an oral presentation and also make 30 logs like within <laughs> within that amount of time. So it was awesome because that would have taken a couple like probably the better part of a half a day for me to do mm -hmm. by myself and instead it took an hour and a half. So yeah, but even with like lots of stops for questions and talking and everything, so it was totally a team process. However, they are not insured to use power tools in my classes. Um, so I did that part with the co-teacher mm -hmm. and they did everything else. So now to answer your the other part of the question, um, once I've got, you know, I've, I've got my, my log, my bolt, um, I've chosen whether or not I'm gonna do plug spawn or sawdust spawn, the holes are all waxed over, everything's good to go, what do I do now? Um, right, so yeah, a couple of people were ready to dash after that and I had to be like, but wait, there's more. <laughs> but they were they were a great audience and very engaged, very inquisitive. So they they handled it fine. Um, once you have your log and you're ready to go, you take it home. Um, on the way home, it's important that you treat it with care because um, if you take a giant gouge out of the bark, um, that's gonna wick moisture out of that hole in the bark unless you wax the giant hole you've just made by throwing it in the back of your pickup truck. So, you know, put it on the seats of the minivan um, and don't, you know, throw it or, you know, the seats of the truck. Don't throw it in the back of the truck or if it's going to go there, place it gently, get it home. And we're going to put it in a place that is ideally um, shady, out of the sun, but going to get wet when it rains. And then ideally also off of the ground. So um, all those things together, what does that look like? At the Refuge Food Forest in Normal, Illinois, where I've got 50, 48 to 50 odd logs from last year. Um, what we've done is we put um, a circle of pallets um, around the base of a giant bald cypress tree that's in the middle of our site. Bald cypress retains its needles for not all of the year. It sheds them before the winter, but um, it retains their, I, I think, I don't know if they're actually needles. Um, it retains their, whatever I think are needles for most of the year. So that means it's in the shade, which is nice. Our site is a little bit windier than I would like though. Um, so, you know, it should be, um, you know, on the on the east side of a house where the prevailing winds aren't gonna get it um, out of the sun, out of the direct sun, and then in a place where you have access to water off the ground. So we've done them on pallets. You stack them lengthwise really close together in their first six to 12 months as what is called the spawn run is happening. So that spawn is going to run through the log and eat the woody material, colonize the log um, to the point where the log is effectively one big shiitake fungus, right? And the only way that that happens is if it's kept pretty, pretty well moist um, with either a sprinkler or you could dump some water on it with a five gallon bucket or a watering can. And you only really need to water your logs just like you would water plants um, when it's really hot, like consistently or if it's really windy or low humidity consistently. So we're talking about end of June through July and August through even September, the last two Septembers have been pretty hot. Um, so once a week minimum, we wanna water those logs with something like a sprinkler or um, a watering can for like 20 minutes. So definitely sprinkler is the most um, ideal option because who wants to stand around and water something for 20 minutes, not me. So we rig up a little sprinkler next to it that covers all of our pallets, keeps everything nice and moist for 20 minutes, once a week. You just, somebody's gotta go remember to go there, turn it on, turn it off type of deal. And then within six to 12 months, we should start seeing our first mushrooms. I have asked this earlier, but I, like, so you mentioned when you're putting the spawn in, you cover up the holes um, yep. with the paraffin so stuff doesn't get in. Do you have to seal the ends? 
of the logs? That's a great question. Um, there are, <laughs> this is like a, <laughs> this is like a division within the school of shiitake uh, log construction. So there are some people who say that that, that inhibits um, kind of oxygen exchange throughout the log the mushroom fungus needs really, really, really little oxygen, but it still needs some because as Chris alluded to at the beginning of the show, they're just like us in that they breathe in O2 and they exhale CO2 versus plants, which are the other way around. Um, so it can um, increase moisture retention in the log, like the native moisture retention of the wet wood that it had, um, which by the way is at its peak um, in the dormant part of the year. So you really should only source. There's a couple different sources that say you can source logs different times, but the best time to source your logs is from about December till about March, because all the carbohydrates and the energy of the tree are leaving the leaf tissue and the stem and branch tissue and going down into the main heartwood and sapwood of the tree and into the roots. So that's when there's the most bang for your buck in terms of resources and energy in that wood. Um, I do not seal the ends of my logs and i've gotten mushrooms um, i know people who do seal them or um if they're going to be you know leaning up against the side of somebody's house and that one you know bottom part of the log is on the ground that's not super ideal because it could expose the log to competitor fungus but if that's going to be where that's the only thing you can do otherwise you can't do this then it would be ideal to seal that edge of the log that's going to be touching the ground um, so that, you know, competitor fungi have a tougher time getting in the log until such time as the shiitake fungus has made it through the whole thing. And then it'll, it'll be good to go. So that's interesting. So you're using the bark, you're using the wax as kind of yep. a, not only to hold the moisture in, but also as a shield, because I mean, we, yes. when we breathe, we're breathing fungal spores every time we inhale and it's yes. all over around us. So yep. it, it's in a way protecting that log. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So you have to mushrooms have their own immune systems and their own defenses, um, but we have to kind of, you know, steward that along. So if we just, you know, so full disclosure, I haven't gotten a ton of mushrooms out of my logs yet, even though it's been about a year because I was not super good about watering last year. The good news is um, there's a theory that um, mushrooms, mycelium, fungus, that that came from outer space on an mm -hmm. asteroid because mm -hmm. I've heard if you forget to water fungus if you forget to water your mushroom logs oyster mushroom blocks whatever type of mushroom you're growing it'll just abort whatever current growth stage it's at and go dormant and it'll be just sitting there doing nothing waiting for the next time that it's that it's um wet again that's why most um most folks that see you know mushrooms growing on logs or or in the woods um you know anywhere along paths that's why most mushrooms come out after a heavy rain or a temperature swing is because you know it's one of the major fruiting cues of all mushroom species is increase in moisture. So if we just keep that going, that's like, um, that's kind of like, you know, coffee for adults. It's like, they need that to keep going. It, they <laughs> might struggle along without it, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I definitely, it's, it's hard when I have a meeting before the coffee kicks in. I don't know how you do it, Ken. No, coffee's gross. <laughs> You're just high on life, you know. You're just <laughs> you riding go. the riding the wave of life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, or tea, you know, like whatever, whatever the fix is. But they we, <laughs> you know, every human has their own vice, and the vice of a mushroom log is water. <laughs> there you go. So yeah, and um, I think I forgot to mention. Um, so yeah, six to twelve months, we put stuff on pallets, people lean them up against the sides of their house. That works, it's not ideal, but okay. Um, the reason why, like, if you can picture what a pile of logs looks like on a pallet, they're all next to each other, you know, lined up in a big kind of pyramid, really close together, um, low to the ground. The reason that we stack them like that is further to enhance moisture retention, because if they were stacked um, the way that they're stacked when they fruit, like in, in like Lincoln log houses, you put them basically like two going one way and then two perpendicular, two going one way, two perpendicular, and you make a big stack with a column of empty air between that, and lots of air exchange between this tower of mushroom logs. Um, that's great for um, 
mushrooms when they're fruiting for the mushroom logs when they're fruiting because it allows for air exchange it allows for it still allows for water exposure um but uh when when the shiitake mushrooms emerge from the logs they won't get squished by other logs mm -hmm. whereas if they're in that really dense controlled pile um and you forget to you know take them out of that situation um definitely you'll have mushrooms that emerge and then end up like super squished against the log and you can't sell them if you're trying to make money you could eat them but they don't even look appealing so um yeah definitely um best practices are um included in these resources that we're going to link in the show notes but folks do a low a frame on like 12 inch um plastic drainage tube that you could pick up at any um big box hardware store mm -hmm. um or if there's, you know, if you don't have any kids around that you're concerned with the falling log situation, um, you can do that Lincoln log style. Because again, those logs are are pretty heavy. So the, the safe way to do it is something low to the ground that, you know, makes them not completely flat, but not in like a potentially perilous, you know, fall down situation. If there's any, you know, kids around. Kids, cats, squirrels. Kids, cats, yeah. dogs. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So uh nick if we've taken this log sorry i keep calling it a log if we take this bolt <laughs> take this bolt from from log to bolt it's been inoculated mm -hmm. and we have watered our bolts um throughout the year harvest what you mentioned six to 12 months that's a long time to wait how do we how do we harvest them do we just we just shake the logs over a bag. We cut them. <laughs> what do we What do we do with this? Sorry, I don't mean I don't mean to laugh, but I'm just picturing myself like <laughs> shaking a log. It would be really that'd be a good workout. I wouldn't have to go to the Y that day. No, you wouldn't. Um, yeah. So, uh, great question. Um, so again, um, typically, I I do not do I do not do what is called force fruiting. Um, there are people who will let these logs um, go through the spawn run. You'll, if you look at the end of the log, I brought I actually brought a sample log to show in a second. So I'll bring that over here. But if you look at the end of a log that's been treated well, I can't promise that's what you'll see with mine. <laughs> um, if, if you've watered your log every week for six months during that, that warm season, you stacked it well during winter, yada, yada. Um, what you should see at the end of the log is actually that end of the log start to turn white. And that's like an indication that the mycelium has gone most of the way through that log. Um, consumed most of that resource. If you're really lucky and you're a pro, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm only on year two of doing this, but um, I've seen pictures of actually a star pattern of white mycelium at the end of the log because, you know, if you did things exactly four inches apart, um, you might see, you know, a cross or a five pointed star at the end of the log um, because of where that mycelium was introduced into the log. It all grew uniformly. It's perfect. Um, so, once you get to that point, um, you'll go through the natural fruiting um, way, which is, you know, now we're into spring. Um, it hasn't really rained a whole lot here. I know you guys got dumped on over in uh, Macomb just, just recently, um, last weekend. So um, at that point, once that mycelium within the mushroom gets sufficiently saturated after it's consumed most of his food resource, folks will begin to see little button little button looking things start to emerge from those sawdust holes. Um, that's the weakest link in that in that um, log. It's still got most of its wood strength left, even though it's being eaten from the inside out. So the first couple of fruitings will emerge from those those drilled holes. Later fruitings will actually emerge from wherever on the log, which is really cool. Um, but um, yeah, it's important to check after weather events like that or after crazy swings in temperature, like what we're having right now, where it was 60 degrees yesterday and now it'll be 32 tonight plus rain that's perfect fruiting conditions so you see mushrooms come on um you literally can um pull them out of the holes you might get a little like sawdust and wax residue at the base of the mushrooms once folks see them emerge um the better thing to do is just go out there with a nice harvest basket um bowl salad bowl whatever um and a sharp knife um like a paring knife and then just cut the um, mushroom stalk. You can leave it in there. It'll fall out, wither away. The log might reabsorb part of that. And then the cycle continues. Um, when folks do harvest the mushrooms, it's important to check out um, you know, whether or not there are slugs nearby. Slugs actually like these mushrooms. So mm -hmm. it's important to check your logs regularly when you think they're going to fruit to make sure the slugs don't get to them first. 
Um, the other thing, which is like a minor hassle, um, are um, little black, um, what are they called? Little black beetles of various kinds. There's lots of very tiny insects that can like go up and um, hang out in the gills of the mushrooms. But we're cooking all these mushrooms always. You do not want to eat shiitake mushrooms raw. Um, that is encouraged, I guess, with um, portobello, baby bella, button mushrooms, etc. I don't even do that. Um, lots of people um, can have poor GI reaction to eating shiitake raw. So it's important to follow um, basic cooking procedures with those. 10 minutes at least, um, flash fried in a, in a saucepan. Some olive oil or butter would do the trick longer if they want them, you know, denser, et cetera. And those, you won't even notice those bugs. They'll cook right out. <laughs> Extra protein. That's or if it. they're nice, if they're really disgusting and slimy, then, you know, obviously don't eat those. But in that case, um, folks have waited too long. And um, it's just a valuable lesson in um, the importance of checking your logs regularly when it's fruiting time. So in my my brain, I, I've created this idea of we take these little cigarette butts, which are actually like wooden dowels that are inoculated, mm -hmm. yes. and we're just trying to make a bigger cigarette butt out of it, which will then eventually <laughs> create mushrooms, right? That's yep. that's really what we're doing. We're taking these little things, trying to make a much bigger thing, which will give us mushrooms that we're going to cook in our in our olive oil, or in my case, bacon grease, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we'll we'll have some delicious, tasty mushrooms that the uh, umami flavor that we mm -hmm. have so desire. Oh yes, yeah. I think you encapsulated that really well. Um, I'm still working on brevity and trying to explain. You know, I barely even know what's going on. Sometimes it's hard to explain what's going on and in a concise way that's easily digestible. And you've done it again, Chris. My brain's just works in weird okay. ways. I think. Yeah, it does. It doesn't. It doesn't go from point A to point B. It finds a weird uh, way around uh, the woods from and sometimes it works out. Most of the time it doesn't. Um, so uh, I do want to cover one one last point and then I'll I'll show the what the shiitake mushroom looks like and then a, and then a log and then we can be done. But um, so I, I do often get the question, how long do these uh, mushroom logs last? Um, and that kind of has to do with the ideal size um, that the, the bolts are are provided to you. Um, so whenever, um, if, if folks are fortunate enough to come across a landowner, a woodlot owner, um, arborist, et cetera, who's willing and able to provide bolts, which by the way, uh, average asking price could be somewhere between five to seven to eight bucks a log, um, just just the log, like not pre-drilled, but, but cut to the specifications mm -hmm. that we need. So no more than three feet long, um, no more than like four to eight inch diameter with six being like pretty optimal. Um, those logs in general, um, given the right care, not force, force fruited, which folks can look up on their own time. Um, those logs will last about five to six seasons, five, four to five seasons reliably, five to six if they're well taken care of and you get lucky. Um, so it's not just for, you know, a handful of mushrooms. It's for, I think the, I think one of the pages in this University of Vermont extension resource that we'll link in the show notes, I believe said the average um, amount of uh, shiitake harvest per average mushroom bolt. I'm not going to say the number like with any type of uh, specificity because I didn't read it right before this. I read it last year when I got into this, but I believe it's somewhere between one and two pounds per log. Um, so, you know, with with every flush being a quarter pound to a little bit more up towards a half pound if folks get lucky um, or, or more. So a um, lot of variation, just like with gardening, you know, you could get a tomato plant that's just knocking it out of the park for some reason and you don't quite know why. And then others are just kind of struggling to keep up. And then you got the average ones that are between those two. So mushroom logs are the same way. Um, encourage, I encourage folks to think about growing mushrooms just like growing from a seed to a full plant to uh, something that's that's yielding fruit, like a pumpkin or a tomato. Um, but yeah, these things can last a while. Um, and so every year I'm adding to our stockpile of logs out in the food forest, but I'm also in a couple of years going to be retiring some of my first ones to the compost pile and they'll just fall apart into dust. I just like five or six load years. into dust and mycelium. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Circle of life. Very cool. Oh, all right. Uh, there, there is the show and tell uh, uh, part. Okay. So this is what will emerge from the log. This is, that is a shiitake? shiitake mushroom. 
Yep, this is a shiitake mushroom that I picked up at the grocery store. It doesn't look super appealing to me because I've seen what fresh looking log grown shiitake mushrooms look like. They can be, so, you know, for folks just listening, the cap is about the size of my palm, a little smaller than that. Um, I've seen log grown shiitake be like as big as my outstretched hand before. Um, and then I've also seen them be like the size of a silver dollar or a little smaller. So there's a range just like with, you know, produce, but typical brown mushroom, but it's got, you know, an elongated stem. That stem butt came off of, in, in commercial cultivation settings, these are grown on blocks indoors and in controlled environments because it's not, it's not super economically feasible to grow these at a massive scale on logs. It's definitely feasible to grow it as a little part-time side hustle farmer's market type of business. There's somebody in Bloomington Normal who did that for years. She doesn't do it anymore. But so this will emerge from the hole that you've created in your log at some point. You just got to watch for it. And I'm going to put the headset down, come back mm -hmm. with my log, put on the headset so folks can check out what it looks like when it's all done. All right. Okay. Nick, that looked much smaller sitting behind you. And now that you have it closer to the camera, that looks much larger. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to put the camera back. Okay. So no, I am going to grab the camera, get it a little close up here. Okay. So for folks that are watching, this little hole right here that I'm pointing at is was a hole that was drilled into the log. And then we put sawdust wax, sawdust spawn in here, and then we wax it over. It's actually still waxed over now, okay? And then you go further on down, um, you'll notice that the bark is not like damaged in any way. Here's another nice looking um, drill hole with sawdust in it that we managed to inoculate quite well. And then let's see if I can see anything of note. I can't, I cannot see anything of note um, on the top log in terms of that white Oh yeah, I can. If you look, if I look really closely right at the center of the log here where my finger is, there actually mm -hmm. is a little bit of like white mycelium looking stuff, but you'll notice that unfortunately my log is cracked and uh, that happens um, a lot and it is indicative of a log that has not been properly saturated for a long period of time. So that's what happens if you don't water it over a long period of hot weather. It doesn't like kill the log or anything it's just a nice healthy indicator that you didn't do it right <laughs> so if we weren't getting those like nobody has ever done anything like this and the first year like do it perfectly and you see everything you're supposed to see and it goes just according to plan uh, i think we all know that's not how gardening works and no. it's not how growing mushrooms works it, that you gotta you have to kill many things before you figure out how to keep them alive so that's that's what i found out about gardening and yep. probably about growing my own mushrooms because i really do intend to do uh maybe a couple of shiitake logs here and um i have some i have ample access to to maple so great i think i'll still start there well i'll trade you and ken for your um turmeric and galangal and uh, ginger growing knowledge and helping me put up my caterpillar tunnel in exchange for uh, some shiitake workshop knowledge. Uh, there you go. I like that. Yeah, I bet people um, people are really interested in mushrooms. I'm sure people are going to hear this and say, uh, does Nick have a mushroom roadshow like where he will go <laughs> and show us how to make these bolts uh, down in uh, southern Illinois, northern Illinois? So you might have to take this on the road. This is going to be... I... Be, I would love to. Let's, let's let it blow up. Yeah, it's going to go huge. Yeah, I, I would love to. Um, I actually got a request last year to speak at um, some type of um, landowners conservation uh, conference um, that a couple of our colleagues were putting together in the Shawnee area of Illinois uh, last year. And uh, the only reason I wasn't able to, to go and speak at the event was because it was the same weekend of my uh, wedding in Wisconsin. Oh. So. I got out of that one, but um, yep. I don't think yep. I could get out of it again. Um, however, um, I, I alluded to this earlier. Um, there is there is a chart that exists on the field and foresight that kind of tells you that the the not so good times to harvest logs, but to harvest wood off of maple for logs. Um, really, the time you want to definitely avoid it is like the height of summer. Um, other than that late fall to like early to mid spring is okay but you really don't want to cut that maple after bud break 
or or butt out because um, then you're you're dealing with lots of sap all over you first of all when you cut it um, and then second of all not all of the potential energy and resources and liquid um, is going to be in that wood making it an inferior product to a log that in that had been um, sourced over the the off season I guess I should say um, the best rule of thumb though is um, logs technically are good up to six months after you cut them as long as you keep them um, inside, ideally in a basement-like storage situation where it's not going to be dry, there's not going to be wind all over them. You're not just throwing them out in your woodlot because those will not work six months later. But if you store them well um, out of the elements, keep them in a cool, dry place. They can last for four to six months and still be good to inoculate. So I could take them on the road. It would just require a little bit of uh, forethought and planning as always. And I'll mention this, this is probably another show altogether, but there are other ways you can grow mushrooms besides, if you don't have access to logs. Yes. There's some you can do on toilet paper rolls. You can buy some at, I've seen them at the nurseries box stores where they have yes. little kits with, with stuff that you can buy as well. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because Chris, before you hopped on, Ken and I were talking about just that. I taught a class on how to grow oyster mushrooms on a toilet paper roll last week at Parkland College for a... Uh, horticulture class and um yeah that's definitely a lot more accessible in terms of physical effort resources um time etc so that's something to think about and yeah that is an interesting topic for another show and uh last thing i'll mention is where to get these cultivation supplies because yeah if i'm listening and i and i want to try something out where do i go um, there are a ton of uh, mushroom, um, commercial mushroom cultivation supply shops popping up everywhere, but there definitely are some tried and true companies that I've worked with, not endorsing them over any of the other newbies, but just saying I've bought stuff from these three companies and it's worked. Um, and those three companies are North Spore out of Maine, um, Field and Forest Products out of uh, Wisconsin, and then um, Fungi Perfecti out of Washington State. Um, fourth one off the top of my head is um, Mossy Creek Mushrooms. I got it. Okay. All right. Good so pull. there's there's four for folks. There's more than that, but tried and true, at least on my end, and, and in terms of working for classes, they've delivered on time. Product is good. Product guarantees. So try it yourself, folks. I am ready to. Well, that was a lot of great information about growing mushrooms, very specifically shiitake mushrooms. Um, so we have, uh, th this has been a fun show. I can't wait to go home and do this myself. Um, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension. This week edited by me, Chris Enroth. A special thanks to local food, small farms educator, Nick Frillman for talking all about shiitake mushrooms. Nick, thank you for being on the show today. Thanks a lot, Chris and Ken, uh, for the questions. And um, yep, there'll be other resources in the show notes and uh, also my contact info. So if anybody has any shiitake or mushroom uh, cultivation related questions, um, send them my way. And a special thanks to Ken Johnson for once again being here with me every single week talking about the gardening thing of our choice. And this is shiitake mushrooms, first fungal, edible fungal topic that we've talked about, I will say. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Learned quite a bit, and I have done the blogs before, but I did not take care of them, and they did not. <laughs> they, did not they did not produce very well, so I'll have to try again. <laughs> yeah, water, water is key, just like plants. So try that and see about different results. Got to go water your logs. Hey, got to keep that in mind. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, Chris, let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. It'll be a garden bite episode for you folks. And we're going to be diving right into the, the heat of the season. I bet I, these cold temperatures have got to be on their way out. It's going to get hot once again, as Ken would say, gross, but uh, it's going to get hot. We're going to be getting out in the garden quite a bit. So listeners, thank you for what you do best. And that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.